three, two, one. Yes, I'm ready to go live. There's always that slightly <laughs> nervous, hesitant moment just before the live button shows to let me know I'm online. And I've just got that millisecond to change my mind and go off and have a cup of tea instead. But why would I do that? I want to be here with you today to talk about overthinking. Now, let me just show the banner here on the screen so you can see what this evening's topic is like, is about even. Welcome to Monday Night Live with Caroline Flanagan. Uh, today, I want to talk to you about a topic that's very, I was going to say close to my heart, but whether you know it or not, it's also actually quite close to yours. If you are someone who suffers from imposter syndrome, then overthinking is going to be a major feature in your life, in your work, in your brain right now, whether you're aware of it or not. So I want to talk about that today. And my aim is to make you more familiar with the expression overthinking. It's a term I don't hear. I haven't really heard out and about. It's not something that you normally hear in association with imposter syndrome. But I think it very beautifully captures what's going on in your brain when you experience those imposter syndrome moments, when that feeling of feeling like you're a fraud and that you don't deserve your success or that some version, whatever it may sound like for you, some version of not being enough, that produces this tendency to overthink. And today I wanna to talk about what exactly overthinking is, what it's costing you in your career, maybe in your life as well, and what you can do to stop doing it. Now, before I get to the nitty gritty, for those of you who don't know me, my name is Caroline Flanagan. I am here live on a Monday evening, 5.30 UK time. Now, the clocks have gone back in the UK um, over the weekend. They went back yesterday. So now we're looking at some really dark, early dark evenings. And in fact, the other side of this camera, it is pitch black outside of my window. And I've got all these lights in here. It's lit up like <laughs> Vegas in my office to make sure that you can see me and I see I'm coming through nice and clearly for you. So I'm Caroline Flanagan. I am the coach for lawyers with imposter syndrome. If you're a lawyer, you have imposter syndrome. I Everything that I produce at the moment, there's so much content on the podcast, my weekly newsletter, these lives, all geared to support you to turn what feels like a weakness, your imposter syndrome, those moments of feeling that you're not enough that are driving so much of the, let's call it unhelpful behavior that you may be experiencing or displaying at work. And I'm going to talk about more, more about that in a minute. So I'm producing all of this uh, content and support and help for you to help you turn that imposter syndrome to your advantage, to make it your strength, by which I mean to help you seize those moments when you're feeling that you're not enough and use them as an opportunity actually to uh, connect with how unique, your unique and valuable and extraordinarily capable self. You know, the one that is responsible for you getting to where you're at, but which you have completely forgotten about or that you like to pretend doesn't exist or you think doesn't exist in those moments when you are under a lot of pressure. So that's who I am. That's my role and my job, my ambition, my goal is to help more of you to stop this overthinking, stop overworking and start getting more of those results that you deserve, more recognition that you deserve. So today's topic then, overthinking. What I mean by overthinking, in its simplest form, overthinking is any thinking that you do that comes from fear, the fear of not being enough. Now, how you experience that fear of not being enough could be, I don't know enough, I'm not experienced enough, I'm not clever enough, educated enough, haven't been well versed enough. Any experience you have about not being around, not being enough that creates a fear in you. And it's when you, your thinking is driven by that fear. Now, 
where does that come from? What's the point and when the connection with imposter syndrome? Well, imposter syndrome, of course, is all about not being enough and thinking you're not enough. So the connection is then, if you are someone who suffers from imposter syndrome, so you are, you do have this experience and these thoughts about not being enough, the chances are it's causing you to overthink. It's causing you to think from a place of fear rather than from what I like to call your highest self, right? The part of you that actually does know what they're doing and is able to call on all the resources that you do have in order to get the job done. So overthinking is, is a distraction from your higher self. And that's why it's so important. I'm going to talk more about that in a moment. A very important distinction. Overthinking is very different to thinking things through. So one of the questions that I've had uh, in uh, connection with this topic so far and on this live is, well, what's the difference? If I'm somebody who, um, you know, I like to think things through, obviously the work that you produce has to be perform to the highest level you have very high standards you want to make sure you do it well protect your brand as one of you were explaining to me after last week's live very important to you to get it right now if you are approaching a piece of work approaching what you do with the intention of getting it right then that if that's driving the thinking that you're doing then it doesn't constitute overthinking there's nothing wrong with taking time to think through what you've done, revisit, check something, or go away and give yourself time to think about it in order to make it the, the right standard, the right piece of work, deliver it to the right level, if that's what's driving it. Where overthinking comes in is where what drives you to go away and think more about it, what drives you to try and give yourself more time is this fear that if you don't, you're going to be found out. The fear that, well, you're not enough, so you need to somehow compensate for that by thinking things through a bit more. Or even what drives your overthinking is just the fact that you're so, you have such a strong feeling of not being enough that you're afraid to actually do it or you're afraid to actually hand over the piece of work and you sit on it, you ruminate over it, you like have lots of thought drama about it. That is thinking that comes from fear and therefore that is overthinking. Some examples, anything that constitutes worry is overthinking. Worry is, of course, it's very fear-based. Worry comes from the fact that what if, you know, if something bad happens, if it's not good enough, if there's a mistake, the worry, so I'm talking about the amount of time that you spend worrying, for example, about a piece of work that you have to do. Maybe the time you spend worrying about a piece of work that you've already done. That, of course, is overthinking. Second, guessing yourself. Oh, I wonder if I've done it right. What happens if I've got it wrong? Maybe that's not the right answer. Maybe I should go back to doing it. All of that thinking is driven by fear, the fear that you're not enough, you haven't done a good enough job, and therefore is overthinking. So you should be quite clear now about the distinction between thinking things through, very important for achieving the quality of work that you like to produce and you know it's important you produce, but where it's driven by the objective, very different to fear-based thinking. So why is this so important? I actually think that overthinking is I want to argue that it's the most important factor in your experience of your work right now, possibly even in your life. It's a bold claim and one you may struggle to actually believe because in your mind, it's quite likely that you're thinking that the problems and issues in your career or in your work or in your life are due to external factors. So it's easy, isn't it? to think that you're struggling at work because of a controlling boss or because you have an incredibly demanding client or because of the culture of working in your office and the number of billable hours you're expected to deliver. However, even though they're unofficial, you may not have official billable hour targets, 
but you have that expectation that you will deliver, you will bill a certain number. It's very easy, isn't it, to, it seems most obvious, I should say, to assume or to credit those external factors for any problems or issues that are coming up for you at work. But what I want to convince you and show you is that actually most of the problems are coming from your overthinking. It's causing and costing you so much. So what are those costs? I'm gonna explain five of those costs to you on this live. Number one, your overthinking, thinking that's driven by fear, the fear of not being enough, your overthinking is responsible for how you feel at work. Now, obviously, if you're thinking in a way that's driven by the fear of not feeling enough, what that does is it creates a lot of negative emotion for you. Anxiety, stress, I've talked about worry, now, all of those negative emotions. So if you're someone who overthinks a lot, you ruminate over things, you thought spiral, you go round and round and round worrying about things, then your most common experience, how you're gonna be feeling at work, a lot of the time, if not most of the time, is anxious and stressed and worried. So overthinking, number one, is responsible for your daily experience of your work, yeah? Um, the cost number two is that overthinking is responsible for you not enjoying your work as much. Now, it sounds as though they're the same thing, but they're different. So the first uh, cost of overthinking is it means you're feeling anxious and stressed and worried most of, most of the day, how you feel at work. The second cost is how you feel about your work. Now, I think it's absolutely fascinating how many of you, of how many also of my clients, when I talk to them about their job, about life as a high performing lawyer in the city, typically, they tell me we spend all this time talking about issues like overthinking, being anxious, thinking you're not enough, and the ways in which that is holding them back in their work. But what is guaranteed is when I ask them about their job, whether they like their career, the answer is always yes. And then I dig further and I say, well, what do you like about it? And I get this whole list of things that my clients love about their work and which you, I'm guessing, love about your work, the intellectual stimulation, that challenge working with really bright, other intelligent people, the camaraderie, the bonding, yeah, the atmosphere that you get with your colleagues, the challenge, the problem-solving opportunities, the opportunity to progress your career. There are so many things. I know you as a lawyer, if you're a lawyer listening, if you're not a lawyer, maybe some things that relate to, you can relate to as well. So many things that you love about your work. But what happens? you're overthinking so much of the time, it means that you don't spend very much time in the enjoyment of a job, a career that you enjoy. Does that make sense? You enjoy your job, but actually most of the time where your head is, where your thinking is, and where your behavior is, is in the space of not enjoying it at all. So overthinking is responsible for how you feel most of the day when you're at work. It's also responsible for how you're feeling about your work because it's stopping you from enjoying all of those concrete, tangible things that you know you find rewarding and enjoyable and fulfilling about your work. And the third thing that uh, overthinking does or costs you in your business, and this is super key, is it causes you to overwork. So I've got overthinking, overthinking causes you to overwork, it causes overworking. Now, at the beginning of this introduction, I think I said that, yes, I work with lawyers who've got an imposter syndrome, and what I do is I stop, I help you to stop overthinking, you stop overworking, and help you start getting the recognition you deserve. So the overworking piece is super important too, and I'm actually going to do a whole episode and live on overworking next Monday. So make sure you tune in next Monday at 5.30 where I'll be 
discussing in depth what overworking is. But for the purposes of understanding how overthinking makes you overwork, overwork is very similar, except the work that you are doing is driven by fear. So overthinking is where your thinking is driven by fear. Overworking is where your work is driven by fear. If I give you two examples of that, you'll know exactly what I mean. Procrastination, where you spend so much time because you're worrying, because you're overthinking, what you do is you put it off. Yeah. You put off doing the job, or you spend a lot of time kind of dancing around doing the job, maybe going off to get more information, going off to supplement what you think you should know, um, going off to ask someone, maybe putting it aside, delaying doing it. All of which, what it does is it means that the work you're doing takes longer. I have clients who will spend three hours worrying about doing a particular piece of work that will take them an hour to do. And what that means is you have spent four hours doing that job. In other words, you are overworking. Yeah, Four hours to a jo do a job that when you sit down to do it, takes you one hour, is working in a way that is unproductive and unhelpful for you. So that's one example of overworking. The second one will be just as familiar to you, if not more so, perfectionism. So clearly, if you are caught up, it's common behavior of yours to try to make things perfect, to labor over your emails. If you saw my live last week or you listened to the podcast, that's the Caroline Flanagan podcast episode, I think 107. That was about laboring over emails, a prime example of the ways, of one of the ways in which if you have imposter syndrome, that can cause you to overthink, which causes you to overwork in the form of trying to make it perfect. All driven by fear, the fear of not being enough, the fear of not knowing enough, the fear of getting it wrong, the fear of not having enough experience. And what it does is it means you labor over it. You go back to it, you rewrite it, you edit it. Could be emails, it could be any piece of work. Maybe you hold on to it, afraid to let it go over to the client or hand it over to your boss or your colleagues because you want to just make that one last change. You just want to check it one last time. So overthinking then, the third cost, the third thing it's costing you in your career is actually time, isn't it? If it's causing you to overwork, it means it's causing you to spend more time working than you need to. And this is so, it's such a tragedy in an environment and in a job and a career which is already requiring so much of you, so much of your time, so much of your resources. So the fact that you are overworking, doing more work even than you need to be doing, is something that we need to resolve. And excitingly, it's something you can resolve because it's within your control. I have a lot of clients and it's a very common trait, I think, in lawyers because the nature of the industry, the pressure and the expectations and the demands that are put on you and the fact that you have to be so reactive and so responsive all of the time is this tendency to overestimate the impact of external factors on you and to completely underestimate your ability to make changes in the way you think and in the way you work that can make all of the difference to how much time your work takes you, to how much free time that then allows you, and also to how you want to work, yeah, and the nature of working and, and the extent to which it intrudes on your personal life. So one of my missions is to give you back some of that power, is to help you feel less powerless in the face of all of those demands that are a natural, integral part of your career and find that enormous window of opportunity that you have to create a more balanced working practice. So the third cost then is overworking. The fourth cost, by definition, as a result of overworking, the fourth cost of overthinking is you underperform. Now, I wanna be clear, I'm not suggesting that if you have imposter syndrome, which causes you to overthink, so you think from a position of fear, 
I'm not suggesting then that the work you produce is of a low standard compared to that which you need to put it into the world. I'm not saying you're, basically I'm not saying you're going out there doing really, really rubbish work. What I am saying is that if you are overthinking and that's making you overwork, what that means is you are spending valuable resources on things that are unhelpful and unproductive. Overthinking is costly. It takes time and it takes energy and it takes focus, right? It takes away focus, right? It takes attention and therefore takes away focus. Overworking is also very costly. It's expensive. It takes time because you're using more time than you need to to get the job done. It takes resources, of course. If you're overworking in the form of worrying about how much, um, worrying about a particular project, then that's taking up your headspace. It's exhausting some of your resources, all of which means that the time, the attention, the focus, the creativity, all of those resources that you do have to bring to the task that you need to do, to bring to your work, means your work is getting less of you. It's getting less of you than you are capable of giving and of uh, contributing to your work or to a particular task. And that means you're underperforming. In other words, you're only performing at a, you're performing at a level that's lower than that which you are capable of. I like to talk about performing at your highest level as the objective, as the aim, as the goal. And when you are performing at your highest level, you're being like your highest, your best self. That's where we want to get to because that's the place where you are your most efficient, your most productive, and where the results you create are going to attract the result, the recognition you deserve. Yeah. So what happens is if you are someone who overthinks, then this tendency to overwork means that you have less resources, you're doing, you're working at a lower level than that which you are capable of. And we don't want that. So it's a cost to you, all of this overthinking. Final point, as a result of the underperforming, performing in other words, at a level that is lower than that which you are capable of, of course, you are not going to be getting the recognition you deserve. You may be getting some recognition. You may be up for promotion. You may, maybe that there's some ways in which you are or you feel you are getting like good feedback. But my point is, if you are underperforming, if you are giving this much to your work, when you have this much to give, then there's a whole, there's so much potential there that is being wasted and therefore not being recognized. So I've highlighted five costs to you of overthinking. And now you can start to appreciate why I consider this one of the most important factors in your experience of your work and your potential in your career. So what do we do about it? How do we stop overthinking. It's exactly what I teach and what my imposter speech program is designed to help you achieve. But I'm going to give you a, an introduction, a summary of how you can stop that right now, what it's going to take. Now, one of the things I want to invite you to start to question is this common perception. And I know it's common because I hear my clients say it. And I also hear it round about this idea that how you think is not up to you, that it's out of your control, that thinking is something that is automatic and not something you can turn on or off. And what I wanna suggest to you is that the opposite is true. Whatever you decide to think is entirely optional. Now, if you're questioning that and thinking, well, if something happens, obviously my reaction to that is gonna be a certain thought, but actually, In any given moment, you can be aware of what you're thinking, aware of the impact of what you're thinking and work out whether that is serving you or not. And if it's not, you can choose to think something differently. So what that means is, if you are somebody who tends to overthink, in other words, you have thoughts that are driven by fear, so you spend time thinking in a way that comes from this feeling, this fear of not being enough, you can choose 
to stop thinking in that way. Now, actually changing what you're thinking, how you're thinking, you're actually already doing this. I don't know, think back on today, did, I'm trying to think of what happened, right, so I went to, it's Monday, right, so I normally, as usual, I go to the park and I work out just before this session, and yes, 10 minutes before I sat down to record this, I looked very, very different, <laughs> actually, it did take me a bit more than 10 minutes to get, cha to get changed and uh, recover from my session, but I go and train in the park, no matter what the weather, with my personal trainer, Holly Aldrich, she's awesome, look her up, um, and now all the way up until the point where I go and train with Holly, I am working, I'm thinking, I know I've got this live coming up, have I prepared for it, there's usually lots of other things going on, I'm doing a big talk tomorrow, very exciting. I'm doing a talk at Middle Temple um, to a room full of barristers and high court judges, and it's going to be huge tomorrow. So, lots of things on my mind. My thinking is in one particular area. I show up in the middle of a field and I see Holly, and she tells me to do a couple of laps of the football pitch. Immediately, right, my thinking goes to Oh, how I'm feeling in my body, whether I'm feeling tired, how, you know, how out of breath I am when I'm running around. So I already switch my thinking on the basis of what I'm about to do. Now, that's not involuntary, that is intentional, because I have shown up to that. I know I've chosen to be there. So I make that switch. Let's say your boss calls you up out of the blue, or you receive a message from a client asking you to do something. Now, a minute, a second before that, you were thinking of something completely different. Then something triggers uh, a different topic or your, this, this thing happens, your client contacts you or your boss reaches out to you. And what happens? You switch your thinking. Now, all I'm saying to you is that instead of letting it be somebody else who triggers that change in thinking in you, that you become the agent of that change, that you be the one to identify when you're having certain thinking patterns that are not helpful to you, not useful, not serving you. In other words, identify when you're overthinking and choose to think differently. And what I want to suggest this is, is just switching from overthinking to intentional thinking. That's the watchword I want you to take away from today. Intentional thinking. In other words, choosing your thoughts based on the results that you want to create. So to take the example of one of those costs I talked about, I talked about five costs of overthinking. If you feel about your when you're going through the day and you are overthinking, so how you feel while you're at work is anxious and worried and stressed because you feel that it comes from feeling you're not enough. The awareness that you are thinking that way and that it's making you feel anxious and stressed, if you are aware of that, you can intentionally choose to not be thinking that in the moment, to not be thinking, I'm not enough, this is really stressful, I don't know enough, I haven't got the experience and you can slip into a different thought. Likewise, if your overthinking is causing you to overwork and to do, like spiral, have this perfectionism spiral is what I call it, it's when you're trying to make it more and more and more perfect, you're just going round and round in circles and you're just changing it, you're not even making it better at a certain point, but it's a spiral and you can't get out of it. Or awareness that you are overthinking, in other words, it's your fear that you're not enough that's causing you to try and make it perfect. Just being aware of that and making the decision to switch into thinking intentionally is enough to break that perfection spiral. So you can choose to stop overthinking any time you want. You can choose to stop thinking anything anytime you want and think in a different way. You could choose that right now to stop thinking about what I'm talking about and start thinking about what you're going to have for dinner. Maybe you're already doing that and wondering, when is she going to wrap this up? I'm sure you're not thinking that at all. But the point is, you have more control over your thoughts than you realize. And my job is to help you recognize that, access that control, put it to use 
in a way that's going to transform your experience of work, how you show up at work so that you're performing much closer to your highest level. So you're getting the recognition that you deserve for the work that you are capable of. So how do we do that? If we go from overthinking to intentional thinking, what on earth do we think instead? And what do we do instead of coming at things from fear? How do we come at them? What, what, is our, what are our thoughts then in those moments? And that's what I, this is the point where I want to introduce or bring you back because if you followed any of my stuff, you will already know about the imposter speech. But this is the point where I want to reintroduce you to the imposter speech. This portable, practical, powerful statement that I've created. It's like a structure I've created for you to give you those intentional thoughts any in any moment of the day when your imposter syndrome is triggered, you're feeling like you're not enough. And that's the fear that that creates causes you to um, overthink and to overwork. The imposter speech, if you've done that process, which reveals to you how capable you are, how unique you are, how uh, valuable you are. In other words, it reveals to you what your highest self is. And in the creation, the using of the speech, it proves to you what you're capable of achieving as your highest self, like from that highest level. It does all of that for you. And the point is you have it ready and with you always to use and apply every single time your imposter syndrome is triggered. And this is really important because remember what I teach, imposter syndrome, it's not a problem you need to fix, it's part of who you are. There are grains of truth in your imposter syndrome. Imposter syndrome doesn't care about the truth in terms of like on paper, how qualified you are, what your role is and what everybody else says about how brilliant you are. Imposter syndrome will still do its thing and make you question whether you're enough. And there'll be some grains of truth in the reason why you're questioning that. It might be that you have had a different education, you come from a different environment, you're used to a different culture. There will be grains of truth in it. That's why I say leave your imposter syndrome alone. You don't need to fix it. It's not a problem. But what you do need to do is make it, learn how to make it work for you. Learn how to solve what I call the puzzle of your imposter syndrome. So the imposter speech solves that puzzle for you. In other words, it gives you immediately on tap the proof, the evidence, the validation, internally driven validation of who you are, how capable you are, how unique and capable you are of creating extraordinary results. So those thoughts, when you have an imposter speech, what it's effectively doing is giving you the ingredients for the intentional thinking that I wanted to invite you to do more of. It's going to tell you that you are in exactly the, you're exactly where you're supposed to be. It's going to tell you that you're there for a reason. It's going to prove to you that you're exactly the right person to be doing this work. It's going to show you actually that it's not even about you. It's bigger than you and that it's a job. It's like a mission that you are on and that you are have been engaged to serve. I'm getting quite woo now. But the point is that when you do the process of creating your imposter speech, all of this value is revealed to you. And when you use your speech, then you are the way in which you use it and the results you get by using it is what proves to you how capable and valuable you are. So to sum up then, if you are someone who suffers from imposter syndrome, what that basically means is that somewhere you have some form of feeling that you're not enough. You're not enough or you're not experienced enough or you don't know enough or you haven't learned enough. Some form of not being enough. From that, that feeling of not being enough creates fear. Not just in you, in me too. I am the biggest student of this work. I am the imposter, as I repeatedly share with you my stories of experiencing imposter syndrome. It creates fear in us. And that fear drives us to overthink. And unfortunately, that overthinking comes, at, it costs us in our career, how we feel about our work, how we feel when we're at work, 
the way we work, causing us to overwork, causing us to underperform and causing us, like stopping us from getting the recognition that we deserve. That's why you want to learn to stop overthinking and start thinking more intentionally. And the imposter speech is the best tool that I know. and I use it, it has transformed my relationship with imposter syndrome and creates results in my work that I could not have imagined possible before I started using this tool. I would love it to do the same for you. If this is something you would like to take deeper, really apply in your work, if you recognize, if you're ready to stop overworking, then come on board, join my community. I have a Facebook group. I would love to invite you to join that, where again, I show up with these lives and there answering any questions that you have around imposter syndrome and you become part of a growing community of imposter syndrome sufferers, former sufferers who are now embracing their imposter syndrome and starting to learn how it can be a strength, an opportunity to show up at their highest level. So come on over and join me there. Otherwise, come in over to the website carolineplanningen.com and download your free guide. I'm very proud of this free guide to the secret signs of imposter syndrome. Maybe you're not really sure whether you do actually suffer from imposter syndrome because the words feeling like a fraud don't really resonate with you. Well, there are so many other signs and I've created this free guide to help you identify if they apply to you. That's it from me this evening. Thank you so much. I appreciate you if you are watching this live. If you've watched this in the replay, I hope you found it interesting and valuable. Let me know. What are your thoughts, your comments about overworking? Is it a concept that you've come, sorry, of overthinking? Overworking is for next week. I'm getting ahead of myself. Is it a concept that you, that resonates with you? Can you see how it's holding you back in your career? And most importantly, are you ready to start changing that? My name's Caroline Flanagan. It's been my absolute pleasure. I wish you a beautiful evening and I will see you same time, 5.30 UK time next Monday on Caroline Flanagan's Live. Thank you so much. Bye for now.